good morning, everybody. It is such a joy to be with you on this last full weekend of July. How many of you know this summer has gone really, really fast and it's been really, really rainy? Can you say amen? But I hope you had just a fantastic week this week. Tamara had such a great week. We were, uh, from Thursday afternoon till Friday afternoon, we were down at Camp Zephyr with our Kids Life Kids and with our students. And uh, all I can say is, wow, it was a wow camp. And uh, the thing that blessed me the most was as I was watching everything that was going on, I realized how much the prayers, significant prayers that parents prayed were being answered by God in the midst of that camp. And uh, I can tell you that, you know, it, it was awesome to see them have the fun that they like to have. I'm just glad I came back dry. They didn't pull any pranks on the pastor. Everybody say praise the Lord for that, right? But, you know, they just didn't have fun. But I can tell you, I saw friendships forming that I knew could really be a blessing to some of the kids in our church. And the sessions were just electric. I mean, the, the worship was electric. The teaching, whether it was general sessions or whether it was workshops that were being done by leaders who invested in our kids during the week, they were just top shelf teachings that were given to our kids. And then the Holy Spirit manifested himself. One, uh, one session I was in, they worshiped half an hour before the teaching. This is our, our students. Then they had teaching. Then, and, and, and what touched me was how many times the students were clapping and it wasn't just like hype the whole the whole theme of the camp for students was beyond hype it was about what God wants to do in their generation and man they were clapping and they were into it how many of you know man if they become the light of the world the enemy can't stand up to the darkness that God's raising up right here in our own church right and uh, so that was powerful and then at the end this was really touching there was a junior high a student, and he looked down, and uh, Jeffrey went up to him during the ministry time, just to ask him how he was doing, and he told him, you know, my, my heart's hurting because my dad left us right before camp, and Jeffrey told me, he said, Dad, he said, I, I wanted to minister to him, but I felt like God said, no, he said, just tell him this, tell him that God's going to touch you in a significant way tonight, and he's going to prove himself to you as your father. And so sure enough, Jeffrey had another leader, leader minister to the kid. And as he was praying for him, and uh, this was new to this kid, he said, man, I feel, I feel a tingling. I feel God's presence. And he had hurt his back really, really bad. And God touched him and God healed his back. Isn't that awesome? And when Jeffrey told me that story, I thought about another young man I knew who was 17 years old. And the trainers at the University of Pittsburgh told him he would miss his entire senior year of basketball. And an orthopedic surgeon told him he'd have to rest his legs and miss his entire senior year of basketball. But God touched him, and he's redheaded, and he's six foot two, and he's preaching to you this morning. And uh, I just thought about, man, if the God who touched this kid can take him where he's dreaming of taking him, how many of you know some great things are going to happen? So I want to say thank you to all of our tithes, tithers and givers for making this church happen. Thank you to all of you prayer warriors for praying for our kids this week. And uh, can we give our leaders who took time to go down there one more big hand clap for the investment they made as well in our, in our kids. And uh, for all of you online, I'm so glad you're here. I, I know this is a big vacation Sunday, and uh, lots of you are gone, but, but I see you worshiping online. And that's the reason we make the investment we do in our online presence, because Exodus 31, verse 13 says this, when we honor the Sabbath, God promises he'll do something memorable. He'll do something that draws the hearts of our kids to him if we'll just stay consistent in worship. So thank you so much for being consistent consistent in how you worship the Lord this morning. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to love the Father like you loved him. We want to please God like you pleased him. And we thank you today for this teaching from your word that really helps us handle some of the difficulties that we have as we try to do that. Lord, we set our hearts to hear clearly from the Holy Spirit this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... 
We live at a time when many Christian leaders are warning us about our country being at a tipping point. And they're warning us because they know that if we don't serve God well in this season, then we may see a lot of the values that we really cherish in our culture kind of slip away. Most of us know that righteousness is being challenged in our country right now. And that's a serious thing because in Proverbs 14, verse 34, the Bible says this, that it's right. Righteousness that exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And so what that word reproach means is that sin causes what God does to vanish in the group of people. And God's saying to us as believers in this hour that if you don't want what's truly valuable to, to banish in your home and banish in your family and banish in society, then it's important that you learn to serve me really, really well. And I think a lot of us recognize that not only is righteousness being challenged in our country, but righteousness is being changed in our country. That a lot of people who have, you know, influence in different institutions in our land are cynical about spiritual things, and because of that, we're in a, a very big battle as believers. Now, this morning, we're going to see that that's what was in Jesus' heart whenever he taught the parables that we're going to study. Matthew 24, verse 3 says, as this as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives his disciples came to him, him privately and they said when is everything going to happen and what's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age now if you go to Israel you'll see that where Jesus was sitting that day there are lots of graves of very prominent Jewish citizens and the reason for that is because they know according to Zechariah chapter 14 that when the Messiah returns his feet are going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. And because of that, people who have notoriety and wealth, they want to be buried there where the, where the Messiah is going to touch down. And so it was the perfect place for the disciples to ask Jesus this question, what are going to be the signs that tell us that you're going to return? And Jesus went on at first to say some things that I don't think really shocked them. He told his followers that they would be surrounded by much religious deception, there would be intense international strife, there would be racial strife and many wars. And then Jesus told them that there would be terrible natural disasters and many hearts would be, be wounded because people would be treating each other in selfish and wicked ways instead of loving as God loved. And we see that in our midst. I think about Rwanda where there was a, a genocide where 800,000 people were killed in just 100 days some time back. And, and you know what's really sad about that particular incident? It's that it was Christians in one tribe who were killing Christians Christians in another tribe because of the racial tension that's in the world. And then let's talk about natural disasters. This, this earth's getting old and it hasn't been stewarded too well. And because of that, there's an increase in natural disasters. And Jesus was telling his disciples, all these things are going to happen before I return. But then Jesus made two summarizing statements because he wanted us to focus right so that in eternity we're grateful for what God did during this time we have on earth. And one of them is in, in Matthew 24, verse 36, when Jesus said, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So Jesus wanted them to know that although he endorsed good teaching on the end of times, and he wanted us to be knowledgeable, not ignorant about the ends of time, Jesus wanted us to to know that the most important focus that we develop as we study these end times is not predicting the hour that Jesus would return, but making sure that we witness and minister to people the way that God wants people ministered to. You know, the Apostle Peter said the same thing in 1 Peter 5, 8, when he said as Christians, we're to be alert and we're to be of a sober mind. Alert means that, you know, with all these things going on around us, we understand what this means and we understand that, that there's something that we need to be doing because of the times that we're living in sober means that you know we're not just kind of you know 
partying our time away, but we are living with intention because we know that this is an important hour. Next, Peter said this. He said, recognize that you have an enemy, the devil, who's prowling around like a roaring lion, and he's looking for people to devour. You know, I read that this week, and I thought about something I didn't know until not long ago, and that is, did you know that when a lion roars in the forest, it's seldom that lion that devours the prey. But the way that the lions work is that one lion will roar in the forest and when he does, the, the, the prey will kind of freak out, get nervous, and will take off running. And, and when he does, it, it runs into a pride or a pack of lions that end up devouring the prey. And Peter wants us to know that that's kind of the way the enemy is. He gets people afraid, he gets people concerned, he gets people all upset, and pretty soon they run to play that instead of really trusting God to protect them, they run into places that end up being destructive to their lives. And when I read that, I thought about the buffaloes. You know, buffaloes are smart. Because one buffalo doesn't have the power to stand up to a lion on his own. But how many of you know if you get a whole herd of buffaloes and they outnumber the lions, the buffaloes are going to win the war, right? And to me, that's what happens whenever we come to church on Sunday morning. We all come together. And how many of you know if we stick together and we teach God's truth and we love one another, we can watch that the enemy, the lion, the devil, is not able to stand up to the church that God built in our midst. Amen? And that's what Jesus wants. He wants our family to be safe and saved. He wants us to have influence in the world, not to be destroyed by the world. And that's why he taught these parables. Now, there's a second summarizing statement that Jesus gave. And this statement is in Matthew 24, verse 37, when Jesus says, it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah, whenever the, the Son of Man returns. And most of us know that the, the days of Noah were days where values were out of control. And basically, the way people lived was, if I think it's pleasurable to me, then I should have the freedom to pursue this if I think it's pleasurable to me. And they wanted to live as if God never sent any prophets. He never sent his son to the world. But if it's pleasurable to me, then I think that's the kind of life that I should pursue. And Jesus said, you're going to be fighting these two things whenever you know, I, I get ready to return. Number one, he said, you're going to have a church that is more interested in predicting when I'm coming back than they are ministering to people. And then he said, the other challenge you're going to have is that, you know, things that used to be called righteous, they're going to be challenged. In fact, there are going to be a lot of people who change the concept of what God says is righteous. So this morning I did something. I brought a flag with me that I want to put up on the screen. And a lot of us know that this would be the pride flag that was designed by the gay community. And it was designed in 1978 by the first openly gay public official in California. And he had it designed as a celebration of the love that that community has for each other. Now, when I show that, there's two emotions that come into the room. And the first emotion that's appropriate is some of you are saying, what is pastor going to say about this? Because because I have friends, I have relatives, I have people who really have adopted, you know, an alternative lifestyle to what has been the traditional lifestyle of Christianity. And you know what? They're here today, and if he says something wrong, they're going to feel judged by the church, and they're going to leave, and they're never going to come back again. And you know what you're going to learn from Jesus in today's parable? You're going to learn that it's appropriate for you to have that kind of love and that kind of concern for your friends. But there are other people that when you see the flag you get angry. And part of the reason I chose it this morning is because this year in June at our American embassy in Vatican City, they flew this pride flag in June. And many Catholics were in an uproar because they thought, who are they to challenge our values to this degree here in the Vatican? And so some of you are saying, I'm all for the love stuff, but pastor, what about the fact that God has addressed this in scripture? 
what in the world are we supposed to do? And that's what Jesus is going to help us with as believers today. I, we're going to find some help from something Jesus did in John chapter 12 first. And I love the context of this verse because it says, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, the people still didn't believe in Jesus. And so Jesus had already healed a lot of people. He had taught some incredible messages up to this point, but there were people who still didn't believe in the Lord. Now, why does that happen? Well, you can read as you study the text that it happens because even though people believe in the Lord, it doesn't always mean that there are lifestyle choices that they want to leave to serve the Lord, or sometimes people have a lot of persecution around them, and they want to serve the Lord, but they don't want to get their parents mad at them. They don't want to lose a boyfriend or a girlfriend because they're serving the Lord. And because of that, even though Jesus is doing a lot, people kind of have a hard time making the choice that they should. And the reality is, listen, that's true today. I want to say to people, how in the world can you not believe in Jesus Christ with all the miracles that he did and the 300 plus prophecies that he fulfilled? How in the world can you not believe in him? And most of the time, the issue isn't whether they believe in him. The issue is something that's going on in their heart that, that Jesus knew that he had to help them deal with. So listen to what the Bible says. It says, when Jesus saw these people in this condition... That first of all, he cried out. And I think that's important whenever people are in this condition that we cry out and we bring clarity to the world that we live in. Then Jesus said, whoever believes in me doesn't just believe in me, but in the one who sent me. In other words, Jesus made it clear that he wasn't some cult leader trying to get people to follow him, but he was trying to get people to follow an eternal plan that God has clearly sent to the earth through prophets throughout the ages. Then Jesus said this, the one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. You know what Jesus understood? That people follow people walking right a lot more than they follow people talking right, right? He understood that it was important not just that we talk about Christ, but in scripture we're called to be the body of Christ. And that's so important if we want to influence as many hearts as God needs us to influence in this hour. And then the next thing Jesus said in verse 46 was he said, I've come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And that's what we saw in the first parable of Matthew 25, that after Jesus said, you know, before I come, it's going to be a dangerous world. It's going to be a difficult world. What did Jesus ask us to do? He asked us to have a relationship with God where we had the light of the Holy Spirit and it was shining in our hearts, and it was shining in the world where we lived, and because of that, people were getting help. And Jesus warned us that there was half of the church of that day who, even though they came to church, they didn't have that kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit in their hearts, and he said they're going to really regret eternity because of the fact they were so casual in their faith. And this was so interesting to me that when I studied it this week, first of all, it, it's easy for Christians sometimes to condemn people who aren't Christians, but I want you to listen to the scripture in Proverbs 20, verse 27. The Bible says the human spirit is the lamp of the Lord, and that's the one that, that's what sheds light on somebody's inmost being. So we have to remember that if the Lord didn't live in my heart, and the Lord didn't live in my heart until I was 17 years old, and I can tell you because of that, it was just natural for me to feel like if I was was pl uh, pleased by something, then it was right, and I should do it. If I wasn't pleased by something, it was wrong. And I understand why people say, just leave me alone, because you know what? I have the right to live my own life. But the Bible says, because of that, we as Christians, first of all, in Matthew 5, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. 
And when Jesus said we're the light of the world in Matthew 5, he was talking about a lamp that lit the typical Jewish home. And God needs us, parents, not just to come to church casually every once in a while, but he needs us to understand our children are living in a very dark world. It's not a world where they're just having righteousness challenged. They're having what's called righteous changed. And we need to spend time with them in family devotions, and we need to make sure we're consistent in church so the light of the Holy Spirit floods the soul of our children. But the second time that Jesus talked about us being light in Matthew 25, a different word used, and this Greek word means a torch that lights the way as people walk outside in the darkness. So God calls us not just to be the light that our home needs, but God also calls us to be the light that our society needs. And that's what Jesus did. Whenever miracles were done, and people should have believed in him, Jesus first said, hey, I came to shine the light. I want you all to think deeper about the reason that I'm here. But then listen to this phrase that Jesus said, because I can tell you when I read this in the Bible, I had read the Bible 40 times from beginning to end, and I'd never seen this verse when I read it. And it was so shocking to me that I went back and I read it in a number of different translations. And then I said to Tamara, have you ever heard anybody preach on this verse? And she said to me, no, I've never heard anybody preach on this verse. And I said, listen to what Jesus said, because this is really, really powerful. And that is in John 12, 47, Jesus said this, after he said he was going to be a light, he said, listen, but if anyone hears my words, but doesn't keep them he said I don't judge that person for I didn't come to judge the world but I came to save the world isn't it interesting that Jesus would say that among unbelievers I'm very very careful that I don't come across judgmental when I'm around unbelievers I'm really really careful that they don't see me live in a self-satisfied state because I feel like I won an argument whenever I didn't win a person's heart and Jesus was teaching us something really important that the second parable is going to talk to us about, and that is shining God's light well causes people to see the path of God's salvation, and that's really important, but loving and serving people well helps them overcome the stumbling blocks to their salvation, and it's important that we do that well too. I remember years ago when I had just taken over the church, I was the president of the school board of Faith Academy initially. I'm not the president anymore because I feel like as a pastor, I pastor all the schools in the region, but back then I was because I wanted to know how Faith Academy was working. And and that year we had a girl who grew up in the church and she ended up getting pregnant outside of marriage. And we had a policy manual that Christian schools use across the country. And and I looked in there to see what we were supposed to do and it said we were supposed to kick her out of school. And I remember struggling with that in prayer. I thought, Lord, if she gets kicked out of school because she got pregnant, she's going to feel like the church judged her not that it loved her so as a young pastor I went before the school board and and I talked to them about who I felt like God wanted our our church to really help and I said can't we set up a pace system can't we do something to show her that Jesus didn't come into the world to judge people he came into the world to love people and to save people and you know when I was doing that I knew that she could be gone from church forever if she was judged. And I'm here to report to you today, she's not gone from church. She loves church and she loves Jesus and she's helping other people because she wasn't judged, but she was loved. And it's so important we learn to do what Jesus talked about us doing in this parable. And it's important that we learn that it is difficult. I want to read to you what Noah had to do to see his family saved. In Hebrews 11 verse 7, the Bible says, by faith, when Noah was warned about the things yet seen in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. I want to ask you this morning, is that holy fear what's dominating your heart? Because we have enough end time teaching 
that we should be alert and sober like the Apostle Peter said. But it's not enough just to have a little bit of knowledge or to predict when maybe he's going to come. It's important that we affect the lives of our family and the people around us the way that God's called us to. And Noah did. He was serious about building his family so that they followed God. He was serious about building a church where many people came and they followed God. And you can contrast Noah to Lot. Lot was somebody who knew God's ways, but whenever the end came, and Jesus also said in the end it'll be like the days of Lot, when Lot tried to talk to his family about doing the right thing, you know what the Bible says? It says they thought he was joking because you know what? He was never really serious about the things of God before then. And so it's important that like Noah, in holy fear, we come to church, we build an ark, we do the right things. We don't scoff at what's right. We don't scoff at spiritual things, but we're serious about spiritual things. And then this is interesting. The Bible says that Noah, by his faith, condemned the world. And because of that, he became an heir of the righteousness that's keeping with faith. Now, you may say at this point, well, pastor, you just said we're not supposed to judge people but then you just read that Noah condemned the world no you have to understand that word world in the Greek is the cosmos and what that mean is means is that Noah lovingly understood what was going on in the world and he was a light like Jesus was a light and he let them know that's not the world as God sees it. Jesus called us to a heaven on earth lifestyle and and things that you might think are right because they're bringing you pleasure. If you're honest, they're also bringing some people pain around you and and perhaps they're not God's best. And I want to shine the light, but can I tell you something more than anything? I want to love you and I want to see that you understand the value of what it means to be loved by an almighty God who sent his son. And how many of you are glad That son didn't come to condemn us, man. He came to save us, and he came to show us how much God really loved us. And Jesus set such a great example for us. And then when he talked to the disciples, who he was afraid they were more concerned about predicting the end than they were loving people. And Jesus said, you got two jobs to do. Number one, you got to be the light But number two, you have to really love people. I love something that Dr. Adrian Rogers said, who is an incredible pastor. He's in heaven now. But I've never forgotten this phrase that he shared. He said, loveless truth is brutal. Truthless love is hypocrisy. But love spoken in truth is necessary to save people's lives. And then he expanded. He said, if you share the truth with people, but you don't really love them, He said, listen, if you leave and you feel self-satisfied winning an argument when you turned off a heart, what have you really accomplished eternally? But then he said, in the same way, to say you love somebody without speaking the truth is hypocrisy. If you allow people to make choices that are going to cause everything that's valuable and beautiful to be stolen from their life, if you talk to them in ways that allow eternity and heaven to be stolen, how could that possibly be the love that Jesus demonstrated. Can you see how hard this task is and why we have to get really good at what the Bible says in Ephesians 4 when it says we have to speak the truth in love and grow in every respect to the mature body of him who's the head that's even Christ. I remember when I was praying over that girl's life that I was reading Romans 8 and it talked about how we can know in all things God's going to work for the good of those who love him who live called according to his purpose. But then when I went down a few more verses, the Bible said this, who is it that condemns us? It's not Jesus. Jesus came to die for us. He didn't come to condemn us. And then it says, what shall separate us from the love of God? And I can tell you as a pastor, I want people to know that just as God works for their good in all things, they can always count on me to want to work for their good in all things. And I want them to know I'll never compromise the truth because of If I compromise the truth, it means I don't really love you. I might love having you as a church member. I might want your approval. Listen, I'm not concerned about your approval. I'm concerned about you and your kids and your family standing on streets of gold saying, thank God we knew the truth. Amen? 
And thank God we were in a place of love where our human weakness, where we knew we'd be loved no matter what happened. And that's what Jesus is calling us to in this parable. He talks about three men, and he starts in Matthew 25, verse 14. He says, again, it'll be like a man who went on a journey and he called his servants to him. Now, he started with again because this is the second parable. And Jesus is saying, in the first parable, I talked to you about shining the light. In this parable, I'm going to talk to you about loving people. And it says, again, he went on the journey and he called his servants and he entrusted his wealth to them. Now, what is the wealth of Jesus? Of course, it's people, right? It's really our wealth, too. I promise you, when I come to the end of my life, I'm not going to be thinking about the fact the $200 fishing rod got broken. Can you say amen? I'm going to be thinking about my wife. I'm going to be thinking about my kids. I'm going to think, be thinking about my church family and all the people that I love. And Jesus wanted them to know, I didn't just entrust a message to you. I entrusted the wealth of my heart to you. And that's the people of this world that I came into this world because of my great love for them. And then it says that to one of three servants, Jesus gave five bags of gold, to another two bags of gold, to another one bag of gold, each according to his ability. Then he went on a journey. And scholars say two things about this verse. Number one, you know, this may sound kind of, you know, outdated. What's he doing giving people bags of gold? But in that day, a bag of gold was worth 20 years of service. That a slave that served for 20 years, it was worth one bag of gold. And what Jesus was talking about is what is our service on earth really going to accomplish? The other thing scholars talk about is how Jesus talked about three servants in the parable, and it's because we all serve God with three basic things in our life. Number one, God's given us time to serve him. Number two, God's given us talents to serve him. And he hasn't given us all the same amount of talent, but he's, all, he's given us all some time, and he's given us some talent to serve the Lord with and then God's given us resource to serve him with and the story goes on and it says that the man who received five bags of gold went at once and he got to work and he gained five bags more and the one who had two bags of gold gained two more but there was a third servant the Bible says he received one bag and he went off and he dug a hole in the ground and he hid his money and then it says after a long time the master of those servants returned and settled accounts. The disciples should have known that Jesus wasn't coming back in a day or two whenever he told this parable. And it says that when he comes back that he spoke to the man who had five bags of gold. And the five bag man with five bags said, Lord, he said, I've invested. It gained five uh, bags more. And listen to Jesus' response. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, do you notice he didn't say, well done, you pastor of a church that's a certain size. Well done, you multimillionaire who gave a lot of money to do things around the world. Jesus doesn't judge us like man judges, but there's two things he's going to judge us for. Did you live with a good heart? Did you shine the light like I call you to shine the light? Did you love people the way I call you to love people? And then did you do the best that you could with what you had? Because listen, there's not going to be a few superstars who cause God's kingdom to be established all over the world. But how many of you know if the body of Christ all over the world lives with a good heart, and if we're faithful to Jesus, we're going to see what happened in Scripture. We're going to see a revival come to earth. Come on, somebody. And we're going to meet him up in heaven. And we're going to hear him say, well done, you good and faithful servant. And that's what Jesus was training for when he said two of them with different amount of resources did awesome. And they had a lot to rejoice over in heaven. But he said there was a third one. He didn't do so good. And he shows us why we get robbed of our reward. First of all, he had a false view of God and his potential. Verse 24 says, this man who received one bag of gold came. And he said, Master, I know you're a hard man. You harvest where you haven't sown. And you gather where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. See, I knew who you were. 
but I didn't serve you like I should. And you know what's wrong with this guy? He had a false view of God. God wasn't a hard man. God was a compassionate person who was urging him to do what would really cause his life to count. You know, some people here today, I can tell you, until you get past thinking that God, you know, is calling you to standards, you should resist. You're never going to love God like you should. God isn't someone to be resisted. God's a God who rewards people who obey him. Can you say amen? Until you quit seeing church as an obligation and you see it as an opportunity, you're never going to really find the value that you should find in church. Then there's a second thing. Not only did he have a false view of God, but he had a misconception of freedom. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you know I harvest where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered. Shouldn't you have at least put money on deposit with the bankers so when I returned I would have received it back with interest? See, God's just saying to the guy, Listen, here's the real problem. You were wicked. You know what wickedness is? Wickedness is not treating your fellow man right. All sins in the Bible can be put in two classifications. Godlessness means we're not honoring God with our life the way we should. Wickedness means we're not treating the people around us the way that we should. And God, God said, instead of loving me and loving people like you should, you weren't treating people right. And you know what? You were lazy too. You were doing the wrong things instead of the right things with your life. And then Jesus said the third thing, and that is that this person who wasn't commended by God, he also had a poor view of the future. And God said to him, so take this bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. And here's why. Whoever has, more is going to be given and they'll have abundance. Whoever doesn't have, what they have will be taken from them. Do you know the pandemic is doing this all across the country right now? There are churches going bankrupt. There are other churches that are strong, getting hold of those churches and putting leaders developed in their churches, in those churches. And there's a shift right now that I'm convinced is from God. And I want to be among those who are fruitful when I get to heaven, not those who should have been fruitful. Can you say amen? And Jesus called us to that. Then he closed with this phrase. He said this, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, some people mistakenly believe Jesus is talking about heaven in this verse, but he's not talking about heaven because we don't get to heaven because of our works. Ephesians 2 says that we're saved by grace. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any of us could boast. So nobody's going to be thrown into hell because they did the wrong works. They're going to go to hell because they didn't choose to receive Jesus, who did the finished work that causes all of us to be able to be forgiven. But what Jesus was doing here is this was an idiom that was very, very common in that society. Just like we would say as Americans... It's raining cats and dogs outside. How many of y'all ever heard that phrase? It's raining cats and dogs. That doesn't mean poodles and pit bulls are falling out of the sky, right? Because if poodles and pit bulls are falling out of the sky, we need better umbrellas than the one I have. But what it means is, man, it's really raining hard. And when Jesus said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, do you know what he was saying? He was, going to say, he was saying in eternity, there are going to be a lot of people who have profound regret that's what it meant weeping and gnashing your teeth I have profound regret why would we have profound regret because we didn't save our families like Noah did we didn't save the people around us like like God's called us to how many of you are here today and you say pastor you know what I see this is a special hour we're living in and I'm going to serve Jesus, and I'm going to shine the light, and I'm going to see lots of people come to God in the season that we're in. And when I'm done, I'm going to hear, well done, you good and faithful servant. Amen. Would you put your hand on your heart? I want to pray for you this morning. Lord, thank you for people who honored you. Lord, thank you for people like Noah who see that we live in a crazy world, a world where righteousness isn't being just challenged, but People are trying to change what it is. And they're trying to tell our kids that God's ways aren't right. And Jesus, we honor you this morning. We thank you this morning for being such an incredible, incredible Savior. The anointing you walked in proved the reality of who God is. 
the incredible teachings you've left. But Lord, the model that you called us to follow is so important. And Lord, we repent for being full of fear at times and not shining the light the way that we needed to shine the light to our relatives. God, we repent for those times we were unloving. And Lord, we might have won an argument, but God, you were up in heaven saying, hey, it's hearts I'm after. Not just winning arguments, but it's winning the souls of people. Lord, I declare today that in our homes, Lord, we're not going to be overcome by culture. God, we're going to overcome it like Noah did. Lord, in this city where we live, God, I thank you people are going to be like those you dreamed of with torches, lifting up the light, helping people see the way to you. Lord, we're so grateful for the model you set and the teaching you gave. In his name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Well, hey, can we stand in an attitude of prayer for just a moment? And before we go, I know there's some special people in this room. And uh, what I love to do at this part of service is just ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes and just pray for the person at, on your right, on your left, so they can think a little bit about what's going on on the inside of their hearts. You know, I love this scripture in Luke 19, verse 10. It's talking about Jesus, and it says that he came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus knew that just coming and dying for our sins wasn't really going to be enough to bring us to God and so he even modeled this one day there was this man that was ripping everybody off in town and Jesus was walking through the city and he stopped and he looked up at that man who was in a in a tree and he said man can I come to your house can I talk to you today and this man gave his heart to God and Jesus was so happy he said man today salvation came to Zacchaeus it came to the one who didn't know that God loved him and you know, God seeks our hearts. He does it in lots of ways. Sometimes we're laying in bed at night and God's voice comes and we know that was God who was talking to us. Maybe we're driving down the road and we see a church. Well, it was God who raised up that church because he was seeking us out. He was trying to get our attention so that he could save our life. But one thing we know about Jesus is he doesn't want anybody condemned for their sins. He wants everybody saved from their sins. So with every head bowed, every eye closed this morning, if you're here and you say, you know what, Pastor Jim, my heart isn't where it needs to be with God. I'm not living as close to God as I should be. And today, I want to know 100% I'm going to heaven. I'm ready to say no to sin. I'm ready to say yes to God. And this God who sought me out, I want to live a life saved by him. If that's you today and you want included in this special prayer, we're going to pray for you at your seat as we close the service. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. I just want you to shoot your hand in the air. You ready? One, two, three. Shoot your hand up high. To do that, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you over here. God bless you right back there. That's awesome. Anybody else? You say, I know the times that God's sought me out. And I need to go beyond just God talking to me. I need to give my heart to him. If that's you, just wave your hand at me all over this place. Awesome. Awesome. Let me ask one more question. Maybe you're here. You say, Jim, you know, I'm a believer. But, man, I've, I've strayed from God. And I need to come back to God. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you wave your hand at me too all over this place? If today you need to come back to the Lord. Awesome. Awesome. Love seeing couples right over here. Couples doing this together. Families doing this together awesome anybody else you say today i'm ready to give my heart to god awesome awesome the church family you can look up let's put our hand on our heart and let's pray with those who, who lifted their hands let's say lord jesus thank you so much for coming to earth so we'd know how real god's love is and how incredible his ability to save lives truly is. Today, Lord, I say no to sin, and I say yes to you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to live in God's best and to live in heaven. I say yes today. Amen. Amen. Yeah, well, let's give those who prayed a good hand. 
And if you prayed that prayer, I want you to know God wants this to be the start of something really, really special in your life. In fact, Proverbs 4.18 says this, that the light of the righteous is like the first gleaming of dawn, and it keeps getting brighter. So the darkest day of our life should be the day that Jesus found us in sin. And I'm not saying we won't go through dark seasons and tough times, we do. But your life is kind of like the stock market. If it's doing the right thing, it keeps going up. Can you say amen? And God wants to help you do that. So before you go today, we've prepared a packet to help. Uh, it's by our offering buckets. Uh, buckets. It's a white packet. It's absolutely free today as you go. And in it's a book, 30 Days to a New Beginning. It's a devotional that will help you. You can also schedule your baptism and celebrate, you know, the new beginning. Jesus said, believe and be baptized. And then also uh, there's a card in there that, that you can help find, it, find ministries or help you find ministries for you and the people that you love. Help you start building the kind of friendships that can really help you grow strong in the faith. So again, we're so glad that you're here and that we believe God's going to do some great, great things in the days ahead. Amen. All right, let's give our pastor another good hand for such a good message. Such a good word today. I appreciate how hard Pastor Jim works to, to feed us each week. Man, if you, if you learn this lesson, it'll solve half the conflicts you have with people. So what a, what a wonderful message. I want us to turn to a scripture as we get ready to uh, receive our tithes and offerings for the Lord's work today. And uh, there's a scripture I just want to remind you of, and I, uh, I kind of looked to see what he was preaching on, and then uh, this scripture came to me for the offering as, as a result. Notice that uh, Jesus is saying, hey, when you give to the needy, don't toot your own horn, so to speak, right? Don't announce it. Don't make a big deal out of it. He said, that's what the hypocrites do. But then notice this. He said this. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Notice that Jesus is saying that we should give in secret and then God will reward openly. You know, when we're faithful and obedient to give a portion of our income to God, he blesses us back. And you say, Pastor, are you saying to me I'm going to get every dollar I give, he's going to give me a dollar back? No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying, life's going to go really good for you. You see, when you live in a way that honors God and you give him glory for it, his blessing comes to you abundantly. You know, I, I often pray over our own finances, but I don't pray for God to prosper me. Let me tell you what I do. I pray for God to bless me because prosperity can be stolen, but blessing can't. You see, the difference is if you're trying to get financial prosperity, that, that's that's all because you did something. But when God blesses you, the Bible says it's the blessing of the Lord that makes a man rich. You see, there's so much more that comes to us when we tithe and give offerings than can be measured by money. There's so many more. Kids that serve God, you know, things that go well for you. Uh, kids that don't get hurt. You know, I had uh, three girls that all played athletics, and the only thing we ever had was one time was a sprained ankle. And it was really my fault because I got in strife with Jenny over something and uh, opened the door for it. Other than that, no injury. And so what I'm telling you, a blessing will come if you serve him like that. And so I want to just thank you today for being a church that you are. I want to thank you for being the people that you are, people that want to honor God with, with the, the resources that God gives them. You know, Jenny and I have tithed our entire marriage uh, almost 49 years, we've, been, we've always given God a tenth of everything we had. And God's always blessed us, and he's always rewarded us for, for being faithful to God. And so I want to thank you for people in this church that are so faithful. That's why we get to do all the things we get to do. It's because of faithful people. Without faithful people, we'd never be able to have House of Palms going for the third one 
uh, in India. We wouldn't be able to do all the things we get to do, all the missionaries that are supported and all the outreaches that get done and all the things that have been done in our community cannot be done without people that love God enough that say, you know what, I'm going to honor God with my tithe and our church is going to be awesome and I'm just thankful I get to be a little bitty part of something big that God blesses and that God works among us. Amen? And how many glad you get to be a little part of it too? Come on, give him a good hand. We get to be a part of what God's doing. And so uh, as we get ready to give today, the offering boxes uh, are at the exit. So let's prepare our offering and get ready to give this morning. Let's take our gift, put it in our hand, and let's just ask God to bless it. Father, we just lift our gift up to you today, and God, we just ask that you would bless every giver today. Ask that you would bless them as they give. Ask that you would put a blessing on their life, that, Father God, that they would know that you're blessing them. So, Lord, thank you for the privilege of being a part of such a great church together, and thank you, Father God, for how you bless us and how you lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite the prayer partners to prepare to come. They'll be here for after service, and they'll be glad to pray with you. Let's all stand together, and we'll uh, pronounce the blessing upon us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Go have a great week. Guys, we are so excited that you are here with us today. It was an amazing word, don't you think? So I hope you guys are encouraged and strengthened today from this message. I know Pastor Jim works really hard, so I'm sure he hopes the same thing. And I know God's got big plans to use through this message for you guys. So we're so excited you were here. Hey, if you gave your life to Jesus today, we just want to say congratulations. We're so excited for you. It's the best decision you could ever make, and I promise you, you'll never regret it. And we're just really excited for, for you and for your new walk with Jesus. And if you did do that today, we want you to get your gift that they were talking about in service. Make sure you put your information uh, right there in the comment section so that we can get you your packet so that you can have the right material to you know, start this walk with Jesus because it's really important to have that. So we want to make sure you get your gift. It's really important. We love you guys. We hope you have the best week ever. Just know that we're praying for you and God loves you so much. Have a good week and we'll see you soon.